let's uh, let's pray and then we'll start let's let's look to the lord and let's pray yes lord we we come before you we come to your presence and lord we call upon your name the name that is above every other name lord thank you lord that you have um, given us health and strength and lord you have given us um, everything lord that we have uh, received and enjoy we thank you for the blessings that you have given us we thank you for the life that you have given us lord we thank you for everything that we have received from your hand father god lord we have prayed and asked and you have given and we have prayed and asked and you have promised and so god this morning we we give you praise and thanks for all the things that we have received lord till today god everything every good thing lord that we have received from you lord um and the, and we want to thank you for everything that you have promised and so god we look to you and um uh, uh the things that we have not yet received but you have promised lord um lord we want to give thanks for that as well we want to give thanks for that as well lord things that we have not yet received but you have promised and we have asked and you have heard we want to give thanks for that lord yes master we we want to give thanks uh, in faith we want to give thanks lord knowing that uh, knowing whom we have asked yes lord hallelujah we bless your name we bless your name we give you thanks we praise you jesus thank you lord thank you the giver of good gifts we thank you the one who outgives all other givers we thank you we thank you lord because you're a generous giver we thank you that you're so liberal god we thank you lord everything lord uh, the book of james we see that you give wisdom lord liberally and without ridiculing lord without making fun god we we want to thank you yes master we give you praise we give you all the glory in jesus name we pray amen amen okay so um we'll continue with uh, our second corinthians uh, study and uh, last class we we finished with chapter 9 right chapter 9 we um chapter 9 the last verse uh, chapter 9 the whole chapter 9 was about more more details about giving and um and how we should give uh, cheerful giver and we we looked at uh, how paul teaches about uh, you know the one he's thanking god and he's and he's saying you know may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food and uh, you know the two aspects of god's giving Uh, seed to the sower something that needs to be done with that uh, with, with that supply or with that finances and bread for food so something that that it needs to be you know spent on oneself um, you know both come from his hand so uh, we saw that um and and then paul finishes chapter 9 uh, in verse 15 um he says thanks be to god for his indescribable gift right uh, for his indescribable gift meaning salvation uh and the salvation to th- through Jesus right and and the fact that the, the Lord Jesus um, went to the cross on our behalf so this thank be to God for his indescribable gift so um it's talking about God being the giver and how he is given uh which is um, you know selflessly and sacrificially uh, and so on right now in let's move on to chapter 10 today okay let me just project the notes um okay there you go sorry yeah i think it should have come on the screen yeah okay so chapter 10 okay now um chapter 10 onwards right till the end of this episode paul um he talks about the um the reality and the um authenticity of his ministry okay of the apostolic ministry uh and particularly he's talking about the way in which he and his team have ministered and he also in doing so he also warns about the false apostles Right? he warns about others who are calling themselves apostles and others who are traveling and visiting like 
churches and uh, particularly Corinth and ministering. So he warns about them, warns about their life, lifestyle, warns about them. Uh, he also shares about uh, his uh, encounter, his spiritual experience uh, with the Lord and and some other instructions. Right. So from here on 10, 11, 12, 13, uh, this is what he shares. Okay. So let's uh, read from chapter 10, verse 1. Um, now I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent am bold toward you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Okay, so um, Paul, uh, you know, he's, uh, he, he says that he's pleading with the Corinthian believers. You know, we, we know what, Pleading is pleading is literally begging. You know, I'm I'm asking you, uh, and uh, pleading with what he says with the meekness and gentleness uh, of Christ. Right? The, the very very characteristics qualities which the Lord Jesus um, has, the meekness and gentleness. So he's saying I'm pleading with these uh, with these qualities. Um, who uh, you know in the presence in your presence physically when I'm present, uh, you know you think that I'm very lowly among you. I'm very humble. But when I'm away from you, I uh, think that I'm I'm not like that. Right? So um, you seem to have this kind of an opinion about me. And in verse 2, he says, but I beg you that when I'm present, that I may not be bold with that confidence, but which I intend to be bold against some. Okay. So some of, you know, you, you're saying, you know, in our presence, he's not bold in his like you know, uh, previous um, uh, this thing also, uh, previous um, previously also we we see that they they had this um, impression that his letters are weighty, but in in his presence, but his uh, you know his uh, physical appearance and his in his presence, um, in our presence he is uh, he's not so um, right. So uh, you you they, so that they had this kind of opinion, but he, but he's saying you know. Um, you know, I wish to be bold and confident, uh, a bold uh, with that confidence against some of you or in your presence against some of you, uh, which means that uh, some of them were uh, living a life or doing something which was uh, not according to the word, not according to the will of God. So he's saying, um, I wish to be, uh, you know, my, I beg you that I'm, when I'm present, I may not be having that boldness, same boldness. In your presence, because he's saying, you know, he'll, he'll come with a strong hand of correction, right? Um, and what are those people thinking? You know? So he's saying that who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. So one is that opinion that that he's he's not bold only in the presence, only in front of us he is bold, but uh, when he's absent, um, you know, he is. Uh, uh, only, only, only. In, sorry, only in front of us, uh, you know, he seems to be meek and and gentle, and all humble. But you know, away from our presence, he is he's opposite of that. Uh, uh, and some people think like that. So, and those people also think that um, these people actually, Paul and his team, they walk according to the flesh, which means that uh, they are not walk, walking according to the spirit. They, the way they live their life. Is not uh, is not according to uh, the spirit, but according to the flesh. Okay, so they're saying that you know they are they are living like that. Okay, that was one of their opinions or accusations. Right? Um, and then so Paul says, 
verse 3 for though we walk in the flesh we do not war according to the flesh so he makes a distinction between walking in the flesh and uh, living according to the flesh okay so there's a difference so walking in the flesh meaning um, uh, living as human beings on the earth right we walk in the flesh we are we have flesh and blood so we walk in the flesh so um, that is something that is true uh, of all of us but according to the flesh meaning according to the desires according to the pull and the dictates of the flesh so it's good to see what does the flesh uh, represent right uh, so we we see in scripture in the new testament the word sarx is used s a r x sarx is used to uh, um, uh, to talk about the flesh right uh, to denote flesh so it's is used in different ways it it actually refers to people because they are flesh and blood people it that word is used to refer to the physical body right uh, that uh, that our physical body you know we are flesh and blood um it is also used to refer to something that is natural and earthly and human okay natural earthly human it is also used as uh, something that is uh, a food is used for nourishment or source of life um let's read uh, maybe probably 1 corinthians 8 and verse 13 um it says therefore if food makes my brother stumble i will never again eat meat lest i make my brother stumble like paul says that when he's saying you know about the about the weaker brother that i will not uh, make the weaker brother stumble so in that uh, you know uh, is saying i will eat no flesh uh i will less i offend the weaker brother okay so we we see that um uh sorry he says i will ne- never again me- eat meat uh, less i uh, offend uh, or make the weaker brother stumble so we see uh, several uh, you know uh, verses which uh, which refer to this uh, this word sarx used in different ways then also we see uh, the sinful carnal appetites and passions and desires which we which is no, normally what we commonly refer to right uh, when we say things of the flesh it refers to the fleshly appetites or carnal appetites something that is not of the spirit of god right so um, so what is the difference in the flesh according to the flesh because paul says though we walk in the flesh we do not war according to the flesh so the thing is that yeah we do walk as human beings okay we do live as human beings um but the war that we do the fight that we fight the the thing that we do in order to um engage in this battle that is not according to the flesh so that is not uh, in other words he's saying that is not carnal right uh, that is not carnal or that is not fleshly and the reason being that it is a spiritual war okay it is a spiritual war um because he says that we do not war according to the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in god so it is not a fleshly weapon so it's something that is mighty in god something that is uh, something that is opposite of that something that is spiritual right and these spiritual we- with these spiritual weapons paul goes on to say this is what we do for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in god and then he goes on to list down some of the things that these weapons are capable of doing as they fight this um this battle okay which is not carnal but spiritual so he says these are mighty in god for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments bringing down everything you know he says uh, bringing every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of god so bringing down everything that tries to lift itself above or against the knowledge of god okay and to bring every thought captive in order to obey christ okay 
So he says, this is what the spiritual weapons are capable of doing. Because, um, you know, every thought captive, the last one, she says, uh, because that is what is capable of rebelling against God. Now, that is what produces rebellion, right? So if it is uh, uh, pulling down a stronghold, a stronghold, again, prevents you from obeying God, prevents a person from uh, fulfilling God's wishes, God's desires, arguments, you know, arguments, these are the things which are coming against the, uh, coming against the truth. Right? You argue, you, or you put forth certain, uh, certain, uh, uh, when, when we say we argue against the truth, we say, okay, these, this, we put forth some reasonings. Okay, this is the reason, this is the reason. We justify and we argue against the truth. So he says, you know, this weapon is capable of pulling down arguments and bringing down everything that every knowledge that tries to exalt itself against the knowledge of God or uh, above the knowledge of God and bringing every thought captive. Okay, every thought is brought captive to the obedience of Christ. Um, so now, um, just a minute. So we see this uh, progression, you know, thoughts resulting in uh, reasonings or arguments. And then we see, um, um, one second, um, we see thoughts, reasonings, which result in imaginations, and then which result in strongholds. Right. So, so we see that progression. There is a, the thoughts are there. And then it it, it leads to uh, arguments, reasonings, uh, which again influences our imagination, and uh, and then we see uh, strongholds. Right? So let's um, uh, so we see that uh, this spiritual weapon is what is capable of bringing down these, things. and we studied this in and and cost conquest of the mind, right? So only these uh, spiritual weapons are capable of bringing this down. Okay, uh, we see a similar pattern, right? Uh, when when we look at uh, James one and verse fourteen, James one verse fourteen says, "But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth." death. So uh, is it talk, James is talking about the pattern. It starts with the thought. It's, uh, you know, desires, your own desires, your own thoughts. Uh, you're drawn away, drawn away from something, right? So it says he's drawn away by his, his own desires, drawn away from God, drawn away from his word, um, drawn away from what God wants and enticed, meaning ensnared or trapped, and something happens, desire gives birth to sin. Okay, when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin in the sense there is a time uh, which, you know, time taken in all this, there is a time period and it gives birth to sin, meaning the the act of sin or the action um, that happens. Okay, and when sin is full grown, uh, it brings forth death. Okay, when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. So, it's talking about the battlefield of the mind, thoughts, reasonings, imaginations, strongholds, and uh, and then we see that the carnal, the web, where you know, even though we walk as human beings, we do not war, fight this fight as human beings. You know, and he and he Paul, the reason he shares this is because people are saying that people are off the opinion. Some of the Corinthians are saying, okay, these guys are actually living according to the flesh. You know, they're not living a spiritual life. They are living according to the flesh. So, uh, so Paul is countering that saying, hey, this is what it is, right? Uh, we, uh, we walk according to the, according to the spirit and uh, not according to the, uh, according to the flesh, even though we walk, um, you know, uh, in the flesh, meaning we walk as human beings, we live in this world as human beings, but we, um, uh, this is what we do. This is how we live our lives, right? Okay, then let's look at verses 7 onwards. So 7 onwards, he's uh, talking about how uh, 
people how they come to these conclusions how they you know judge these conclusions or how uh, how they come to this kind of a thing saying okay these guys are living like this or they are living uh, 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 as dictated by the flesh uh, they're not living a spiritual life so paul is uh, addressing that right so here he says uh, from verse 7 onwards you know do you look at things according to the outward appearance if anyone is convinced himself that he is christ's let him again consider this in in himself that just as he is christ's even so we are christ's for even if i should boast somewhat about our authority which the lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction i shall not be ashamed ashamed lest i seem to terrify you by letters for his letters they say are weighty and powerful but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible let such a person consider this that what we are in words in word by letters when we are absent such we will be in deed when we are present so so paul is actually uh, you know he's responding to those who are judging uh, because of their of physical appearance and outward appearance um and he is um uh, he's responding to that right he's addressing those people and uh, and uh, he's saying that you know are you looking at things outwardly right? if you if you're convinced that you belong to Christ i want you to know that just as you are in Christ we are in Christ and um, and we have the authority okay the lord gave us for edification and not for destruction so he's saying you know we have uh, because of the responsibility and the call that god has given us to minister to you god has given us the authority okay so he has given us authority spiritual authority uh, the apostolic authority and the lord has given this to us so that we can build others so he's saying you know uh, if i should boast you know uh, i shall not be ashamed okay meaning um like even if i should uh, boast about this authority okay i would not be ashamed in the sense you know i i don't want to boast about it it's not good to boast but even if i should boast about this authority you know i will not be ashamed because it has been given for your edification for you to be built up and not for your destruction okay so is is talking something about the authority apostolic authority um that uh, believers have been given in line with the call uh, uh, god's call and that authority is always for building up people and it is never for destroying people's lives so you know that's a take away for us as believers and as ministers of god as leaders that the yes god does give us authority and he places us in spiritual authority uh, in leadership responsibility and that authority is always to build up people to speak into people's lives to build up people and it's never to uh, destroy people's lives okay um so you know here we see uh, what they've been talking about him you know, they say that uh, his again they are judging by outward appearance and his speech and etc and he's saying that um, you know his uh, his appearance is um uh, uh, just one second so he's yeah saying that um, his letters are weighty and powerful but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible so he's, he's judging him by the way he looked and judging him by how he spoke right and he's saying he's not very impressive in in front of us right? so you see you know all the things that are Uh, that they are actually uh, talking or thinking about him but despite that he is actually ministering to them with the gentleness and the meekness uh, of the lord jesus okay which is commendable is going back to them and, and ministering to them and continuing to minister to them even though some of them some of them thought um, thought uh, this of him right um, so paul is saying that you know i want i want you to know you know verse 11 that 
what we are in word by letters in what we have communicated we will be in presence also so there won't be any difference right uh, if we had said something that uh, this is how you need to live or this is how we are living we will be the same way in our uh, you know in our, in in your presence as well when we are there when we meet you we will be the same way there will be no difference okay um and then let's look at uh, verse 12 onwards 12 to 18 okay for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise we however however will not boast beyond measure but within the limits of the sphere which god appointed us a sphere which especially includes you for we are not over extending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you for it was to you that we came with the gospel of christ not boasting of things beyond measure that is in other men's labors but having hope that as your faith is increased we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment but he who glories let him glory in the lord for not he who commends himself is approved but whom the lord commends okay. so here again uh, a very um, uh, interesting and very important uh, perspective that paul shares so these people um, were there in uh, the corinthian church and also some of them who thought highly of themselves and they were comparing themselves with with themselves right and and saying that uh, and they were commending themselves let's say uh, you know we are better uh, and we are better than most people they were comparing themselves commending themselves so and paul is saying you know why uh he's giving some reasons why we should not do that okay reason number 1 when we compare ourselves with another person we are using we are using some qualities and abilities um as a standard for comparing comparison and that comparison is the other person that we are comparing or we are looking at the other person and saying okay my life is not as as uh you know uh, as uh, bad as that person it's better okay so they are not using god's standards but really using uh, comparing and looking at the other person and uh, looking at using that as a standard for comparison okay using that as a as a reference point right as a scale to compare so paul is saying you know that's that's not wise that's not a wise thing to do because you're anyway falling short of god's standard are you using god's standard to look at your life and saying hey your life is good or your life your what you're doing is actually commendable right and uh, secondly saying you know don't do that don't compare and uh, don't don't put down people or don't exalt yourself because it is uh, not one who commends himself right who is approved but whom the lord commends when the lord says okay this is who you are that is what really matters right that is that is the most important thing so um so paul is saying you know i refuse to boast or compare or commend in these ways right um so he also goes on to say talk about uh you know we will not boast beyond measure but within the limits of the sphere which god appointed us so he's talking about the fact that okay see god has placed us here he is uh, we are laboring here we are visiting you know these kind of these places this is our mission field and he uses the a greek word called metron okay metron which means a sphere or a sphere of influence okay which, which means area of influence okay if you want to call it that you know our influence our ministerial influence uh, extends to you know this region or these are the places we are so we will not boast beyond that 
okay we will not uh, if i don't recognize this if i don't acknowledge that god has you know called us to this and um, you know uh, and we have ministered here then i will be overextending you know i i'm i'm causing confusion because it is another person's labor another person's work and you know i'm i'm boasting about that as if it's it is my own as if god has used me you know to um, to minister to their, those people which is not true right so i'm over extending myself so he's saying um uh, we will not boast beyond measure but within the limits of the sphere or the area which god appointed us a sphere which especially includes we, you for we are not over extending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you for it was to you we came with the gospel of christ not boasting of things beyond measure that is in other men's labors but having hope as your faith is increased we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere to preach the gospel and so on so he's saying you know uh, this is we'll we'll stick to our area of, of influence and of course this influence will grow according to the will of god according to the plan of god uh, you know he will extend it he will expand our influence as we remain faithful to the call but we will not boast beyond that right we will not talk about another man's labors and not boast beyond that but he also says let him who glories uh, uh, let him glory in the lord verse 17 you know if at all there you know any glorifying anything that needs to be done let him glory in the lord okay so uh, i can't take this i can't boast and i can't say you know i've done all this and this is my accomplishment let him glory in the lord because ultimately ultimately it's um it's the lord's commendation it's what the lord approves which finally matters right so let he who glories let him glory in the lord um so this um he actually continues in this manner in verse sorry in chapter 11 also right but uh, when we when we read chapter 10 we see that okay this is um in the corinthian church there were people with this kind of mindset right who were not really accepting the ministry of paul or who were looking at paul and comparing him uh, according to outward uh outward uh, appearance uh in terms of speech in terms of uh, you know um uh, in terms of uh, what were uh, you know what they would uh, uh in terms of speech in terms of outward appearance etc so that was one thing and they were also comparing him uh you know to others other uh Uh, we'll we'll read about that when in verse uh, sorry in chapter 11 we see that the, they are also you know looking at paul and then the reason for that is they are looking at other ministers okay or, or so called apostles and they are actually comparing him to th- those people also who unfortunately are not really ministering according to the way god would uh what would want them to minister right so uh who are looking who are you know who are whose intentions are not um, really pure but they seem to be taken in by that right? they seem to be swayed by that and uh, so paul is actually warning them against such people so he sees talking about that as well right so um yeah so let's look at chapter 11 um and uh, um where he talks about this and then he also talks about the kind of suffering and the kind of hardships that he and his team uh, went through okay okay so let's look at uh, chapter 11 okay verse 1 oh that you would bear with me in a little folly and indeed you do bear with me for i am jealous for you with godly jealousy for i have betrothed you to one husband that i may present you as a chaste virgin to christ but i fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived eve by his craftiness uh, 
so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Okay. So um, he goes on to talk about uh, his ministry, etc. later. But then he goes on to say that, you know, I have actually, uh, I am jealous for you. Okay. It's not that he is possessive of them and that he they need to, you know, listen only to him. It's not like that, right? But um, it's, it's a godly jealousy. And the reason is this. He's saying, I have betrothed you to one husband, meaning I have, you know, uh, you are betrothed to Christ. Right? The church is the bride of Christ. So betrothed meaning, uh, you know, engaged or uh, in, in, it, it means engaged to be married. Right? Uh, that's the that's a term, right? betrothed. Um, just put it here, engaged to be married soon. So Paul, he, he looks at himself as, um, let me just read out what David Guzik says. It's quite... Um, you know, it's quite nice. Paul considers himself the friend of Jesus, the bridegroom, who will do his best to present the bride as a chaste virgin to Christ on the wedding day. When the Corinthian Christians one day stand before Jesus, uh, when the Corinthian Christians stand before Jesus, remember also that engagement wasn't taken lightly in Paul's culture. If someone was unfaithful during the engagement period, it was considered adultery. And an engagement could only be broken by divorce. Um, and another uh, you know, theologian, Clark, this is what he says, in the Jewish culture of that day, the friend of the bridegroom had an important job to procure a husband for the virgin, to guard her and to bear testimony to a corpore corp corporeal and marital endowments. And it was upon this testimony of this friend that the bridegroom chose his bride. He was, uh, you know, inter junior, which means between her and her spouse elect, carrying all messages from her to him and from him to her. For before the marriage, the women were strictly guarded at home with their parents or friends. And also the friend of the bridegroom was called upon, if necessary, to vindicate the character of the bride. So you, you understand that was the culture of those times and that was the seriousness uh, of the betrothal itself, right? So Paul is saying, you know, I have betrothed you to Christ. And, and he's talking about the everything coming to uh, uh, a consummation and that's the marriage supper of the lamb when we will seek you know christ face to face but uh, but i have betrothed you so which means that uh, from now from the you know you have the betrothal period um, from now till the to, till the marriage supper of the lamb you remain faithful Right, you remain engaged. You remain betrothed. So he's saying, uh, you know, th th there are several things about betrothal, about us being the bride of Christ, um, which we can read in, read in the uh, in the book, the House of God. I think you have also studied that in the uh, in last year, the House of God. Uh, so I won't go into that, but you can read through in the notes. Right. So, so what what is Paul saying? You know, there seems to be some kind of an influence. On the Corinthian church, right? So there's from these uh, other ministers who seem to be bringing in a message, who seem to be led by a different spirit, and who seem to be sharing a different gospel, uh, talking about a, Jesus, uh, a different Jesus altogether. So he's saying, uh, you know, he, he's talking about three things, right? Uh, if anyone uh, preaches another Jesus, that's the first thing. Or if you receive a different spirit or a different gospel, okay, you may well put up with it. He's saying if, you, if you're kind of going ahead and receiving this kind of a teaching or this kind of a message and these, these ministers who are you know, talking in these manners, you may well put up with it you know it's it's your problem it's your responsibility okay um and 
he in the in the verses following this he talks about he compares himself right and uh, in order to show the, the true nature of who of those who are whom the corinthians seem to be entertaining right whom the corinthians seem to be uh, inviting and uh, you know accepting their message so he's actually comparing himself to them but uh, his intention is this is not that to exalt himself but really to expose the truth about um, these these people okay so let's read from verse 5 for i consider that i am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles for even though i am untrained in speech yet i am not in knowledge but we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things did i commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because i preached the gospel of god to you free of charge i robbed other churches taking wages from them to minister to you but when i was present with you and in and in need i was a burden to no one for what i lacked the brethren who came from macedonia supplied and in everything i kept myself from being burdensome to you and so i will keep myself as the truth of christ is in me no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of achaia why because i do not love you god knows but what i do i will also continue to do that i may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded that ju- regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast for such are false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into into apostles of christ and no wonder for satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works okay so he, here he's uh, he's comparing himself he's saying i'm not at all inferior inferior means i'm not at all low in quality right uh, as compared when you compare the, uh, myself to the other eminent um uh, uh, apostles so he's saying is nowhere lower uh, is nowhere you know lower in in several ways like influence or rank or power and he also accepts you know that he's untrained or unskilled in speech right uh, because uh, uh, in paul's day and time they were skilled speakers in the sense they were trained to speak in a certain way they were you know uh, they were very skilled and they had oratory skills right they could be uh, like apollos was like that right he could speak in a, in a in a very uh, very good manner a very powerful manner um so paul is saying you know i was not skilled like that and uh, david gusick mentions this in paul's day the ability to speak in a polished sophisticated entertaining way was quite popular others such as the most eminent apostles the corinthian christians loved so much were able to speak in this manner okay so in a, in a polished way in a sophisticated way in a entertaining way but paul was ne- either unable or unwilling to preach in this way right it didn't matter to paul because he wasn't concerned with meeting people's standards for a polished or entertaining speaker he was concerned with faithfully preaching the gospel okay so that's what uh, paul did so he 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 confesses you know i'm i'm not i was not and not trained in such things but he says i'm not untrained in knowledge right i'm not i have learned i know the scriptures i you know received revelation from christ um so i'm not so uh, in i'm though, though in terms of speech and everything i might be untrained but definitely i'm not when it comes to uh, and it comes to knowledge and understanding etc i'm not un- uh, you know you can't say that i'm untrained so uh he says for we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things we've made 
public, the way we are living, the way we conduct ourselves in ministry, it's, it's no secret. We have been thoroughly manifested. And we have been, uh, uh, you knew our lives inside out, the way we lived, the way we conducted ourselves, the way we did ministry, been thoroughly you know, made clear, made visible. Our lives were transparent right? in, all, in all areas. Okay? And now um, in verses 7 to 11, he talks about um, uh, he talks about how he did not um, he did not take money from them for his expenses. Right? So he says, he, verse seven: Did I commit sin in humbling myself that uh, you might be exalted because I preached the gospel to you free of charge? Right? And Paul addresses this, you know, when we when we look at. Uh, uh, Acts 20 also, he talks to the efficient elders. He says, I have coveted no, Acts 20 and verse 33, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided uh, for my necessities that those who were with me uh, and for those who were with me, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Okay. Um, Okay, so we'll take a break now and we'll come back at um, 10 o'clock and then continue from here. Okay.